And so I'd now like to introduce today's speakers, all of them companions of the Guild, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which you will then be hearing from them. Arjun Shivaji Jain, who is the convener of today's session, was formerly the Young Companions representative to the board of the Guild. Trained in physics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Rocky and art and science from Central St. Martins in London, he is at present director of the Red House Cultural Center in New Delhi. He's worked in various capacities in various fields in his life, though all prompted in fact from a critical reading of Unto This Last in 2014 which enabled him to accept economics as a valid field of study. He is an advocate for a rich manual as well as intellectual life. Peter Berman is a director of the Guild and holds the portfolios for international relationships. The Guild has members in 12 countries and many of those countries are wonderfully represented in our call today. And for craftsmanship and craftspeople. He is an architectural historian and archivist and has alternated between working for major heritage organizations, the Council for the Care of Churches and Cathedrals, the National Trust for Scotland, and teaching in two universities, York in England and Cottbus in Germany. He chaired the fabric committees of Wren's St. Paul's Cathedral in London for 20 years and that of Lincoln Cathedral, Ruskin's favorite cathedral, favorite building in England for seven years. Helen Parker was born in Sheffield, became a companion in 2015 after volunteering at the Pop-Up Museum in Walkley, one of the Guild's Ruskin in Sheffield projects. She contributed to many Ruskin in Sheffield events and collated research for a Guild publication, Genevieve Pilly, 50 Years Devotion to Ruskin at the Mearsbrook Museum. She has degrees in philosophy and in software engineering and has taught in adult and higher education. And presently, she's involved in uncovering wonderful arts and crafts tiles in the church at her new much-loved home, the Peak District Village of Yulegreave, where purple-veined rock has been exploited for centuries. Frances O'Connor studied medicine at Oxford University and had a career as a GP in Sheffield for many years. Later, she studied for a master's degree in the history of Venetian art at Warwick University, during which she had the terrible torture of spending three months studying in Venice, where she began to learn about Ruskin. And she wrote her final dissertation on Ruskin's St. George's Museum in Walkley on the edge of Sheffield. It was during her research that she discovered the Guild and became a companion. And she has since volunteered, including cataloging all the books in the Ruskin study room at the Millennium Gallery. Last year, she joined the board of the Guild on which she hopes to champion her city, Sheffield, but also the vital importance of inclusivity in education and access to the countryside and the visual arts. And finally, but by no means least, Julia Bolton Holloway, who is in Florence directing the English Cemetery and its library, creating websites and limited edition books, as well as the Academia Vesarium. Formerly a professor of medieval studies in America with a PhD from Berkeley, she was born in Marylebone, London, and now caretakes Elizabeth Barrett Browning's tomb and beside it that of Fanny Holman Hunt. She has published books on Dante Alighieri, his teacher, Brunetto Latino, and women including Julian of Norwich, Vergita of Sweden, Christine de Pizan, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, this last for Penguin. She works with skilled Roma who restore the cemetery's tombs and teaches them the alphabet. And that is your wonderful panel of readers today. And so I'm delighted to hand over to Arjun. Thank you. Arjun, you need to unmute. Yeah. There. Thank you. Um, yes, the book Unto This Lost has really had um, quite substantial influence on my own life. Uh, assignment related, uh, before before having read the book, I was uh, quite, quite
quite opposed to economics as a subject of study and uh, really thought economics to be a very, very bad word and wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, I think the book opened my eyes to at least the possibility of making money uh, while still being remaining good. May I ask, before we begin, may I ask Peter Berman to very briefly uh, link the first uh, reading to this one, where we discussed the first essay, Roots of Honor. Thank you, Arjun. And Thank you, Simon, for introducing us so in such a spirited manner. I really enjoyed it. The first thing I recall about our reading of The Roots of Honor in January is the skillful weaving together of many different voices who spoke the English language with strikingly different inflections. By chance, we were all men's voices on that occasion, but we reflected youthful, almost boyish energy at one end of the spectrum, including the voice of a poet, as well as a literary historian, and the experience of older age, that's me, at the other end of the spectrum. In the middle range was our German colleague, first a stonemason and now an architect, who spoke from an architectural practice dedicated to the care of old buildings, such as Ruskin so much valued and to the wise and skillful adaptation of such buildings so that they have a continuing place in the lives of citizens, including buildings for those very professions which Ruskin singles out, the soldier, the pastor or priest, the physician, the lawyer, and the merchant. We registered how influential unto this last has been and I singled out the impact which the text had had on the Mahatma Gandhi as an example. I am pleased that through Arjun's wisdom and insight, we are going to go more deeply today into Gandhi's response to Ruskin's critique of the standard theory of political economy of his day. In January, we began to ask one another what relevance Ruskin's ideas have for today. I found myself reading of the relationship between master and servant, a passage which recalls the parable from St. Matthew's Gospel from which Ruskin took his title, Unto This Last. Ruskin states the money principle in which, quote, if the servant can get a better place, he is free to take one, and the master can only tell what is the real market value of his labor by requiring as much as he will give. He then contrasts this with what I feel is the kernel of his message in the Roots of Honor. Quote, but he, that is the servant, being on the contrary, an engine whose motive power is a soul. The force of this very peculiar agent as an unknown quantity enters into all the political economists' equations without his knowledge and falsifies every one of their results. The largest quantity of work will not be done by this curious engine for pay or under pressure or by help of any kind of fuel which may be supplied by the cauldron. It will be done only when the motive force, that is to say the will or spirit of the creature, is brought to its greatest strength by its own proper fuel, namely by the affections. At the end of our readings, many valuable observations were made. Jim Spates, for example, who's with us again today, observed that the five great professions analyzed by Ruskin were all based on the idea of service. Matt, our poet, spoke of the value of reading the text out aloud, as we had done. In reading silently, he reminded us, there can be the temptation to skim a text. Dion pointed out that the conversational tone of voice can be very entertaining. Reading the text on a train, just like Gandhi a couple of years ago, he was so engrossed in the sheer enjoyment of the text that he almost missed his stop, his station. 
Helen, who is reading today, found the text gladdening, a truly lovely word, which I feel sure Ruskin would have warmed to. Several of the comments were around how we can adopt the gems of Ruskin's text to the challenges, social, economic, and political, to today, when we're engulfed in the machinations of global capitalism. Let us now go more deeply into Ruskin's thinking together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. The text really is quite relevant to today. Um, the first essay, Rules of Innovate, in my view, is um, the recognition that financial relations between people as close as they can come to be familial relations, the more honorable, the more moral, um, and frankly, even if coldly and hard, hardly uh, evaluated, better they are. The second essay, Veins um, of Wealth, uh, to me, its practical distillation seems to consist of the recognition that this familialness must be extended to one's own self. One is most familiar with one's own self and how this manifests itself practically, I feel, is through the concept of investment, whether of money or of time, what we do with it, how we do with it. And uh, briefly in this essay, but more substantially in the next one, why we do with it. Uh, the format of today's reading will be slightly different to the previous readings. We have divided the text up into three sections. And after each section, there will be a 10 minute um, window, an opportunity for discussion amongst the group. And the readers uh, are invited to uh, present their own reflections before the beginning of these discussions. Uh, we will conclude today's reading by uh, a reading of the introduction and conclusion of Gandhi's paraphrase of Unto This Law. So let us begin. Uh, Helen. Essay 2, Claims of Wealth. The answer by any ordinary political economist to the statements contained in the preceding paper is in few words as follows. It is indeed true that certain advantages of a general nature may be obtained by the development of social affections, but political economists never professed nor profess to take advantages of a general nature into consideration. Our science is simply the science of getting rich. So far from being a fallacious or visionary one, it is found by experience to be practically effective. Persons who follow its precepts do actually become rich, and persons who disobey them become poor. Every capitalist of Europe has acquired his fortune by following the known laws of our science, and increases his capital daily by an adherence to them. It is vain to bring forward tricks of logic against the force of accomplished facts, Every man of business knows by experience how money is made and how it is lost. Pardon me, men of business do indeed know how they themselves made their money or how on occasion they lost it. Playing a long practised game, they are familiar with the chances of its cards and can rightly explain their losses and gains. But they neither know who keeps the bank of the gambling house nor what other games may be played with the same cards, nor what other losses and gains far away among the dark streets are essentially, though invisibly, dependent on theirs in the lighted rooms. They have learned a few and only a few of the laws of mercantile economy, but not one of those of political economy. Primarily, which is very notable and curious, I observe that men of business rarely know the meaning of the word rich. 
at least if they know, they do not in their reasonings allow for the fact that it is a relative word implying its opposite, poor, as positively as the word north implies its opposite, south. Men would speak and write as if riches were absolute, and if it were possible by following certain scientific precepts for everybody to be rich. Whereas riches are a power like that of electricity, acting only through inequalities or negations of itself. The force of the guinea you have in your pocket depends wholly on the default of a guinea in your neighbor's pocket. If he did not want it, it would be of no use to you. The degree of power it possesses depends accurately upon the need or desire he has for it. And the art of making yourself rich in the ordinary mercantile economist sense is therefore equally and necessarily the art of keeping your neighbour poor. I would not contend in this matter, and rarely in any matter, for the acceptance of terms, but I wish the reader clearly and deeply to understand the difference between the two economies to which the terms political and mercantile might not unadvisedly be attached. Political economy, the economy of a state or of citizens, consists simply in the production, preservation and distribution at fittest place and time of useful or pleasurable things. The farmer who cuts his hay at the right time, the shipwright who drives his bolts while home in sound wood, the builder who lays good bricks in well-tempered mortar. The housewife who takes care of her furniture in the parlour and guards against all waste in her kitchen. And the singer who rightly disciplines and never overstrains her voice. Are all political economists in the true and final sense, adding continually to the riches and well-being of the nation to which they belong. But mercantile economy, the economy of murkies, of, of pay, signifies the accumulation in the hands of individuals of legal or moral claim upon or power over the labour of others. Every such claim implying precisely as much poverty or debt on one side as it implies riches or rights on the other. It does not therefore necessarily involve an addition to the actual property or well-being of the state in which it exists. But since this commercial wealth or power over labour is nearly always convertible at once into real property, while real property is not always convertible at once into power over labour, the idea of riches among men in civilised nations generally refers to commercial wealth and in estimating their possessions, they rather calculate the value of their horses and fields by the number of guineas they could get for them than the value of their guineas by the number of horses and fields they could buy with them. There is, however, another reason for this habit of mind, namely that an accumulation of real property is of little use to its owner unless together with it he has commercial power over labour. Thus, suppose any person to be put in possession of a large estate of fruitful land, with rich beds of gold in its gravel, countless herds of cattle in its pastures, houses and gardens, and storefuls full of useful stores. But suppose, after all, he could get no servant. In order that he may be able to have servants, someone in his neighbourhood must be poor and in want of his gold or his corn. Assume that no one is in want of either and that no servants are to be found. He must therefore bake his own bread, make his own clothes, plough his own ground and shepherd his own flocks. His gold will be as useful to him as any other yellow pebbles on his estate. His stores must rot, for he cannot consume them. He can eat no more than another man could eat, and wear no, man, no more than another man could wear. 
he must lead a life of severe and common labor to procure even ordinary comfort. He will ultimately un be unable to keep either houses in repair or fields in cultivation and forced to content himself with a poor man's portion of cottage and garden in the midst of a desert of wasteland, trampled by wild cattle and encumbered by ruins of palaces, which he will hardly mock at himself by calling his own. The most covetous of mankind would, with small exhortation, I presume, accept riches of this kind on these terms. What is really desired under the name of riches is essentially power over men. In its simplest sense, the power of obtaining for our own advantage the labour of servant, tradesman and artist. In wider sense, authority of directing large masses of the nation to various ends, good, trivial or hurtful, according to the mind of the rich person. And this power of wealth, of course, is greater or less in direct proportion to the poverty of the men over whom it is exercised, and in inverse proportion to the number of persons who are as rich as ourselves and who are ready to give the same price for an article of which the supply is limited. If the musician is poor, he will sing for small pay, as long as there is only one person who can pay him. But if there be two or three, he will sing for the one who offers him most. Mm. Um, the power of the riches of the patron, always imperfect and doubtful, as we shall see presently, even when most authoritative, Defends first on the poverty of the artist and then on the limitation of the number of equally wealthy persons who also want seats at the concert. So that, as above stated, the art of becoming rich in the common sense is not absolutely nor finally the art of accumulating much money for ourselves, but also of contriving that our neighbours shall have less. In accurate terms, it is the art of establishing the maximum inequality in our own favour. Now, the establishment of such inequality cannot be shown in the abstract to be either advantageous or disadvantageous to the body of the nation. The rash and absurd assumption that such, such inequalities are necessarily advantageous lies at the root of most of the popular fallacies on the subject of political economy. For the eternal and inevitable law in this matter is that the beneficialness of the inequality depends first on the methods by which it was accomplished, and secondly, on the purposes to which it is applied. Inequalities of wealth unjustly established have assuredly injured the nation in which they exist during their establishment and unjustly directed injure it yet more during their existence. But inequalities of wealth justly established benefit the nation in the course of their establishment and nobly used aid it yet more by their existence. That is to say, among every active and well-governed people, the various strength of individuals tested by full exertion and specially applied to various needs issues in unequal but harmonious results, receiving reward or authority according to its class and service. While in the inactive or ill-governed nation, the gradations of decay and the victories of treason work out also their own rugged system of subjection and success and substitute for the melodious inequalities of concurrent power, the iniquitous dominances and depressions of guilt and misfortune. So at that point, we have been asked to consider perhaps three uh, questions for discussion. Um, do we agree uh, with Ruskin's analysis of the uh, relativity of riches and the impossibility of everybody becoming rich? Um, 
I personally don't have any argument with that. I try to undermine it in my thinking and can't. Uh, the second point we might discuss, does being rich still mean in 21st century society having power over labor? And again, fundamentally, I found it difficult to argue against that. Although if I may be allowed to say one thing, um, Ruskin speaks about rich people wanting power over lots of labor. And I'm not so sure that that is really what the Elon Musks uh, or indeed the Warren Buffetts of this world want. It, it may be uh, what Donald Trump wants, but I'm not sure it's what every uh, rich person wants. And do we agree, the third point for our discussion, do we agree that there are healthy and unhealthy inequalities in society and its distribution of riches? And I'm flummoxed there because I can think of plenty of unhealthy inequalities and outside of people doing voluntary work, I can barely think of any healthy inequalities these days. Uh, I don't want to say any more necessarily at this point. I would like to hear from other companions, please. Can I, can I just add, um, one thing that struck me listening to that was the fact um, there was a reference fairly early on that talked about not knowing what rich, rich people not knowing what rich actually means and conversely, not knowing what poor means. I thought that was a key point in that people can acquire great wealth, but, you know, what, and then question, you know, really what the point of accumulating such wealth is. And likewise, as people become wealthier, they perhaps lose touch with how, how it is to be poor. You know, even people who have been poor, once they acquire wealth, then they they forget how difficult life can be when you are poor. So I, I thought that that really resonated with me, that point, you know, in both ways that, um, you know, the lack of consideration for poorer people uh, in society, which often, if you're not touched by those same problems in your own life, I thought that was a very key point. Sorry, it doesn't probably relate to the points that you raised, Helen, there. <laughs> but, uh, but may I just uh, talk about one observation in London that I had regarding this point that you made. Uh, I very briefly, as an experiment, worked uh, as part of the housekeeping staff at Wembley Stadium for about a month. And uh, it was very interesting to me and it seemed clear to me that um, the difference between being rich and being poor, if you think about this in national terms, uh, it seemed to me that the English are rich because they can come to Wembley Stadium and they can watch the games. While uh, the poor, who in the case of Wembley Stadium are usually the Romanians, they clean up after the English at night. So to me, riches constitute uh, the license to be um, the license to be lazy, almost, so that other people can work for you. And this is what I think power over labor also means. Yes, I feel that power over labor these days. Uh, is of the richest people being able to satisfy their wildest dreams, uh, whereas the poorest people can satisfy no dream at all. Um, I, I'd like to remind us that Ruskin never, never himself, though at one point after his father had died, he became a very rich man. He gave almost all of it away. He never, uh, never endorsed being rich. The the parable of the vineyard owner and his workers is very instructive. Each worker is paid a penny a day. Now, even in those days, that was enough, and that that's one of Ruskin's key ideas. Um, that was enough for them to meet their basic needs. 
a, at a penny a day, you don't get rich, but you get what you need. And Ruskin always is arguing that you, you get what you need, you use it, and if you have anything left over, you give it away in some way to benefit the lives of others. This organic metaphor of the veins of wealth is a very important part of this essay. And the one before was the roots of honor, two organic metaphors. He is trying to make us understand that the thing that matters here is life first, healthy life in particular. And that's what we should be trying to accomplish. Power over others. I went to, out to lunch yesterday and I spent uh, $25 or whatever it was for the two of us. And that, that's power over those folks. Pays them for their time, pays them for their resources that allow them to put food on the table. But nobody got rich doing that. Um, so Ruskin is not abstemious, but he's very clearly, uh, very clearly recommending us all to find out what your needs are and be satisfied with that. That's good enough for your life keeps you going healthily. There is no wealth but life, but we don't have to indulge, as Helen says, all our wildest fantasies. Can I go back to the points that both Helen and Jeff were making, which were really interesting about what wealth enables, what wealthy people now feel their wealth enables them to do? And don't you think that a big part of it now, particularly given the world situation, is that enables wealth enables you to distance and protect yourself from the fate of people who are less wealthy, you know, seen in, in universal terms. And, and I think that's probably one of the big attractions. It, it, it's your point, Helen, about, you know, not necessarily to have power over people, it's to have power away from people. I'd like to say that <clears throat> as a teacher these days, I really struggle to explain some of Ruskin's ideas about about money and how it's spent in a to a group of people who, who don't carry guineas in their pocket. Money to them is a, a virtual concept and, and what they want power over is not people's labor, but people's attention. And so we're always struggling to to have you know someone's online attention and um, social media um, to to gain money that doesn't even exist anymore. I think that fits in with the fact that capital is not just money. You've got financial capital, cultural capital, educational capital. And I think actually very interestingly, what the last speaker has just said, attentional capital, being in the limelight capital, perhaps fueled by social media. I've not quite thought of that before. So thank you for that. Um, I think the meaning of rich and being poor is undoubtedly has been changing. Um, like having money but poor in human relationships will still lead to poverty. And um, probably after the pandemic, um, um, kind of IT technology, how much they are familiar with IT te technology, also creating a large gap between the, the rich and the poor. So meaning of the, the, the wealth and the poverty might be changing. So I'm uh, oh sorry, do you say one more thing and then we should wind up. We've had okay. 10 minutes and move on to the next. I think we also need to be careful that we don't just do such a kind of totally binary discussion, talking about the super rich and the super poor. I think there's the bit in the middle, which also the more nuanced bit in the middle, which is also important. And whereas we talk about relative wealth, relative poverty, I think we also need to acknowledge what the baseline is for the whole society because that has a major implication on what, what how, it, how poverty or super richness is actually defined as a society. Thank you all. Um, Arjun, do you want to introduce the next section before Francis reads? Uh, you know, I think, I think Francis began this continues with uh, where Helen 
and it from so we are still um, okay continuing that analogy where blood uh, in the body yeah inequalities in the flow of blood also Okay. Thus, the circulation of wealth in a nation resembles that of the blood in the natural body. There is one quickness of the currents which comes of cheerful emotion or wholesome exercise, and another which comes of shame or of fever. There is a flush of the body which is full of warmth and life, and another which will pass into putrefaction. The analogy will hold down even to minute particulars. For as diseased local determination of the blood involves depression of the general health of the system, all morbid local action of riches will be found ultimately to involve the weakening of the resources of the body politic. The mode in which this is produced may be at once understood by examining one or two instances of the development of wealth in the simplest possible circumstances. Suppose two sailors cast away on an uninhabited coast and obliged to maintain themselves there by their own labour for a series of years. If they both kept their health and worked steadily and in amity with each other, they might build themselves a convenient house and in time come to possess a certain quantity of cultivated land together with various stores laid up for future use. All these things would be real riches or property, and supposing the men both to have worked equally hard, they would each have right to equal share or use of it. Their political economy would consist merely in careful preservation and just division of these possessions. Perhaps, however, after some time, one or other might be dissatisfied with the results of their common farming and they might in consequence agree to divide the land they had brought under the spade into equal shares so that each might thenceforward work in his own field and live by it. Suppose that after this arrangement had been made, one of them were to fall ill and be unable to work on his land at a critical time, say of sowing or harvest. He would naturally ask the other to sow or reap for him. Then his companion might say with perfect justice, I will do this additional work for you, but if I do it, you must promise to do as much for me as another time. I will count how many hours I spent on your ground and you shall give me a written promise to work for the same number of hours on mine whenever I need your help and you are able to give it. Suppose the disabled man's sickness to continue and that, under various circumstances for several years, requiring the help of the other, he on each occasion gave a written pledge to work, as soon as he was able, at his companion's orders, for the same number of hours which the other had given up to him. What will the positions of the two men be when the invalid is able to resume work? Considered as a polis or state, they will be poorer than they would have been otherwise poorer by the withdrawal of what the sick man's labour would have produced in the interval. His friend may perhaps have toiled with an energy quickened by the enlarged need, but in the end his own land and property must have suffered by the withdrawal of so much of his time and thought from them. And the united property of the two men will be certainly less than it would have been if both had remained in health and activity. But the relations in which they stand to each other are also widely altered. The sick man has not only pledged his labour for some years, but will probably have exhausted his own share of the accumulated stores and will be in consequence for some time dependent on the other for food, which he can only pay or reward him by yet more deeply pledging his own labour. Supposing the written promises to be held entirely valid, among civilised nations, their validity is secured by legal measures. The person who had hitherto worked for both might now, if he chose, rest altogether and pass his time in idleness, not only forcing his companion to redeem all the engagements 
he had already entered into, but exacting from him pledges for further labour to an arbitrary amount for what food he had to advance to him. There might not, from first to last, be the least illegality, in the ordinary sense of the word, in the arrangement, but if a stranger arrived on the coast at this advanced epoch of their political economy, he would find one man commercially rich, the other commercially poor. He would see, perhaps, with no small surprise, one passing his days in idleness, the other labouring for both and living sparely in the hope of recovering his independence at some distant period. This is, of course, an example of one, only out of many ways, in which inequality of possession may be established between different persons, giving rise to the mercantile forms of riches and poverty. In the instance before us, one of the men might from the first have deliberately chosen to be idle and to put his life in pawn for present ease, or he might have mismanaged his land and been compelled to have resource to his neighbour for food and help, pledging his future labour for it. But what I want the reader to note especially is the fact, common to a large number of typical cases of this kind, that the establishment of the mercantile wealth, which consists in a claim upon labour, signifies a political diminution of the real wealth, which consists in substantial possessions. Take another example, more consistent with the ordinary course of affairs of trade. Suppose that three men, instead of two, formed the little isolated republic and found themselves obliged to separate in order to form different pieces of land at some distance from each other along the coast. Each estate furnishing a distinct kind of produce and each more or less in need of the material raised on the other. Suppose that the third man, in order to save the time of all three, undertakes simply to superintend the transference of commodities from one farm to the other, on condition of receiving some sufficiently remunerative share of every parcel of goods conveyed, or of some other parcel received in exchange for it. If this carrier or messenger always brings to each estate from the other, what is chiefly wanted at the right time. The operations of the two farmers will go on prosperously and the largest possible result in produce or wealth will be attained by this little community. But suppose no intercourse between the landowners is possible except through the travelling agent and that after a time, this agent, watching the course of each man's agriculture, keeps back the articles with which he has been entrusted until there comes a period of extreme necessity for them on one side or the other, and then exacts in exchange for them all that the distressed farmer can spare of other kinds of produce. It is easy to see that by ingeniously watching his opportunities, he might possess himself regularly of the greater part of the superfluous produce of the two estates. And at last, in some year of severest trial or scarcity, purchase both for himself and maintain the former proprietors thenceforward as his labourers or servants. This would be a case of commercial wealth acquired on the exactest principles of modern political economy. But more distinctly, even than in the former instance, it is manifest in this, that the wealth of the state or of the three men considered as a society is collectively less than it would have been had the merchant been content with just a profit. The operations of the two agriculturists have been cramped to, so excuse me, cramped to the utmost and the continual limitations of the supply of things they wanted at critical times, together with the failure of courage consequent on the prolongation of a struggle for mere existence without any sense of permanent gain must have seriously diminished the effective results of their labour. And the stores finally accumulated in the merchant's hands will not, 
in any wise be of equivalent value to those which, had his dealings been honest, would have filled at once the granaries of the farmers and his own. So I think I've really enjoyed the close reading of this text and the opportunity to read it out, out loud. Um, I also, um, I'm not an economist, I don't know anything about um, economic history, so it's been really interesting to use Ruskin um, to delve into a little bit of economic um, theory, I guess an insight into, I guess, the ideas of economic theory in the Victorian times. We all come to Ruskin's readings with different our own different lenses. So I'm I'm the lens, I've got the lens of a retired GP. And I quite liked how Ruskin starts this passage with a kind of medical analogy. Even this whole chapter is called the veins of wealth. And I think he very well explains within society if one part of body, one part of society is ill, putrefaction is quite a strong term, I think, these days, um, then it affects the whole body, it affects the whole society. Um, and then I think also we're very lucky to have Arjun and his lens of India and and then the lens of Gandhi coming into this piece. And I think I can see why this kind of agrarian um, models um, approach would appeal to, to Gandhi um, in India under the colonial um, system. So um, and I like these two very simple case studies of of society, starting with two, two men and then starting with three men about how that can explain how a capitalist society grows and the inequalities um, grow within it. So um, thank you for choosing this piece, Arjun. I think I got personally quite a lot out of it. So what does everybody else think? I wanna underscore what I believe is one of the deep and essential messages of this essay, and that's the idea that all money <clears throat> fundamentally is a moral issue. You make money morally or you make money in some way that injures other hu human beings, which Ruskin would regard as immoral. You spend money, and when you spend your money, you use it to enhance life or you use it in some way to degrade life. There are pretty simple examples that we can uh, uh, find. Uh, if, if we smoke cigarettes, we do harm to ourselves, to our families, and to the entire society by degrading our, our ability to function in the world. On the other hand, if we buy and purchase good food, healthy food, we make ourselves stronger, make our families stronger, make our community stronger. For Ruskin, always money-making and money-spending are moral issues. These are these are things that I had to discuss at great length with my students when I was teaching full time. They didn't really want to believe that it mattered very much what you bought or, or what you used it for. You are free to do whatever you like. Yes, Ruskin would say you are free to do what you want, but you should de decide in what you do um, based on its uh, ability to uh, either enhance life or in some way degrade it. Yeah, I agree that morality, sorry, I agree that the morality um, of society is very, very strong in all of this writing. So, I, yeah, I agree with you totally. That we have a moral duty to spend our money wisely, not just for ourselves, but for the greater good. I think the thing that struck me from the reading was the short termism aspect that um, and this, of course, is common to most societies and governments um, that they're not able to um, take long term strategic decisions that would have more beneficial impacts. Everything's determined in the short term. And so consequently, you know, the, the big issues uh, aren't really addressed, for example, um, um, addressing the, the social care issue is so expensive and problematic to governments, successive governments, 
that they don't seem to have addressed the issue. And yet, by addressing that issue, that would have enormous benefits to the hospitals, uh, to the health sector, health sector generally, and so on, and beneficial in all sorts of ways to society more generally. So I think just the short ter termism of, of societies is so is so problematic, really, and it was touched on on that reading. The fact that short termism of society and of the individual, which I think actually mm. takes us back to one of the questions Helen posed mm. around whether we agree about the relativity of riches and the impossibility of all being rich, because we start with this notion of, of a kind of equality, and then inevitably the inequality creeps in in the examples that Ruskin's giving us. And I wonder, and this is very much blue sky utopian thinking, but I wonder might there be a possibility of all being rich and all having enough? And if we were to try to achieve that, what would we need to do? And I, I realize you know, communism has tried to do this, various utopian communities have tried to do this, and inevitably human selfishness gets in the way, but might there be a path to this? I throw that at you and I'm not expecting any answers, but... <laughs> What I found in the discussion of the three people, this is about supply chains and Amazon, where <clears throat> they've undercut the prices of the products, which results in the poverty of the people who work and results in the wealth of the person in charge of, for instance, Amazon. One sees this with bookstores, the independent bookstores, and then Amazon again. And here in Florence, it's become very difficult to buy the supplies you need for crafts because they've become priced out of the market. The rents for the artigiani, the artisans, has also become too high. So the children no longer learn the parent skills. And I found that Ruskin really explained what was going wrong in that uh, dynamic. In my own country, the current conversation um, that this brings to my mind is about student loan debt forgiveness. And I, I, I think often of, of how Ruskin championed education for everyone. And most students in my area can only get an education at it go, by going into extreme debt. And then... Um, the sort of idea of the soul, uh, the sailors on the island comes into play. I, they spend their working life trying to pay for the education they get to get them out of poverty. That's increasingly the case in the UK as well. Um, not as bad as the cost of education in the US, but it, it is slowly getting there for students and the university system being broken by the fact that the government is not resourcing the universities and yet students do need to be getting the education, but that's a sideline. One, one other thing that we have not talked about is that phrase that was used watching the watching of one's opportunities. And uh, it is a very relevant, um, section of the essay, a very modern one and a very individually uh, oriented one as well. Because today, uh, to get to make money, to get rich, the most efficient way would not be to work with your with your hands. It would be to trade other people's work. Uh, if, we, if we consider the, the owning of stock, uh, the engagement with the stock market, it is no longer the owning of stocks of particular companies. We are not uh, we're not trust we're, it's not as though we are trusting the companies that is really not our motivation to be engaging with the market it is so that we can own them but then trade them and trade them while watching our opportunities uh buying the cheapest selling the theorist that is what we are doing that is what the richest people are doing that is essentially what they are doing whether it be investment and trading uh, as far as stocks go or real estate goes, that is what is happening. And uh, 
really Ruskin talks about how immoral this is, there cannot be any more immoral and yet universally established and accepted economic principle. I'm, I'm wondering what, what Ruskin would think about ESG. Does everyone know about ESG? It's basically making ethical investments. And anyone who has any money can choose to put their money into an ethical fund that doesn't hurt the environment, doesn't hurt people, doesn't starve children, doesn't give unnecessary powdered milk to babies, that kind of thing. Um, and it seems like a good idea, but it doesn't actually have any teeth. But anyway, I'm, I'm wondering what, what more expert people than me might think about ESG as a Ruskin trope. I think Ruskin would very much approve. And in fact, we moved the Guild's funds into precisely such an ethical um, investment portfolio a couple of years ago now, uh, because we realized we could not be Ruskinians if we were not absolutely sure that all of our funds were being used in an ethical kind of way. Um, and we, as a board, um, also took the decision that actually companions would agree with that. And even if that meant that there might be uh, a diminution in how much we were earning and even a loss, which often happens when you transfer funds, it was the Ruskinian thing to do to make that move. Um, so yes. <laughs> What, what strikes me in the context of the essay is, and this isn't to in any way um, counter what Rachel has just said about the Guild's portfolio, but Michelle, your question, what I'm struck by is, so you know what you're not doing, but do you know what you are doing? So does ESG allow one to go to feel better and to know that one is doing good because one is not? you know, investing in arms sales and in obvious harm. But it seems to me that part of what Ruskin is saying is you must be attentive at all times to what you are doing and to the sourcing of it and to the chain of it and so on. And, um, you know, I'm very struck, kind of related point, I'm very struck at the moment that as there are, because of all the conflicts in the world, there are shortages of foods and um, trading routes and so on and so forth and noticing people having conversations about where their food has come from mm -hmm. and and it's like it's woken them up in a different way to oh that doesn't just you know what I see in an English supermarket isn't all equally sourced from the same place it all has a, a huge chain as Julia mm -hmm. said you know the supply chain and the supply chain, of course, the longer it is and the further it goes, the more likely there is to be exploitation at the far end of it. And so although there are, of course, huge disadvantages to all these disruptions and, and you know, from loss of life to loss of uh, livelihoods, it does strike me as it has the one positive thing that so much of our education, certainly in England, doesn't do, which is to invite you to be curious <laughs> and to really to be awake all the time to the consequences of everything that you buy, everything that you sell, everything that you consume. Where did it start? How did it start? How has it got to, to me? So that's my query about ethical investment is that I think there are, there are two sides to it. So one is it, if you can avoid doing harm, <laughs> then that is an excellence. But what then are you doing or what is being done on your behalf and what do you know about it? I think then remains the challenge. Can I pick up on that, Simon, just very briefly? Um, it sounds deeply cynical, and it probably is, but, you know, um, with a couple of other charities I've been involved in where we thought we were making ethical investments, it's about how long the supply chain is. Many of them actually have umbrella organisations which are not, in rem the remotest sense, ethical about what they do. Right. Um, and, you know, so floating above in a sub-company of a sub-company of a sub-company of a sub-company will be our ethical investments. Mm. But I don't know how, I mean, it's your point about being really conscious of what you are doing mm. and hoping for the best. Mm. Could, could I raise one more thing on this issue, which is to yes. do with greenwashing, mm. which um, I've recently been preparing a case with the Advertising Standards Authority about something. And it was very interesting to see what the ASA says about greenwashing. 
it says a greenwashed product promises to the consumer that they are making a virtuous choice and therefore the consumer will feel good about buying it and they will also pay more for it and so a dishonestly greenwashed product is stealing basically both from the consumer's conscience and also from their rivals who are not telling lies and I think Ruskin would have absolutely abhorred greenwashing and he would have put his finger on it immediately. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as your timekeeper, apologies, uh, but we've we've gone over our 10 minutes and it, it's important we give justice to the third section of the essay being read by Julia and then Arjun reading from Gandhi. So can I suggest that we pause there and Julia, if you want to um, take up the right. Ruskin invoice. Thank you so much. <laughs> The whole question, therefore, respecting not only the advantage, but even the quantity of national wealth, resolves itself finally into one of abstract justice. It is impossible to conclude of any given mass of acquired wealth, merely by the fact of its existence, whether it signifies good or evil yeah. to the nation in the midst of which it exists. Its real value depends on the moral sign attached to it, just as sternly as that of a mathematical quantity depends on the algebraical sign attached to it. Any given accumulation of commercial wealth may be indicative on the one hand of faithful industries, progressive energies and productive ingenuities, or on the other, it may be indicative of mortal luxury, merciless tyranny, ruinous chicane. Some treasures are heavy with human tears, as an ill-stored harvest with untimely rain, and some gold is brighter in sunshine than it is in substance. And these are not, observe, merely moral or pathetic attributes of riches, which the seeker of riches may, if he chooses, despise. They are literally and sternly material attributes of riches depreciating or exalting incalculably the monastery signification of the sum in question. One mass of money is the outcome of action which has created, another of action which has annihilated ten times as much in the gathering of it, such and such strong hands have been paralyzed as if they had been numbed by nightshade. So many strong men's courage broken, so many productive operations hindered, this and the other false direction given to labor and lying image of prosperity set up on Dura plains, dug into seven times heated furnaces. That which seems to be wealth may, in verity, be only the gilded index of far-reaching ruin. A wrecker's handful of coin gleaned from the beach to which he has beguiled an argosy. A camp follower's bundle of rags unwrapped from the breasts of goodly soldiers dead. The purchased pieces of potter's fields wherein shall be buried together the citizen and the stranger. And therefore, the idea that directions can be given for the gaining of wealth, irrespectively of the consideration of its moral sources, or that any general and technical law of purchase and gain can be set down for national practice, is perhaps the most insolently futile of all that ever beguiled men through their vices. So far as I know, there is not in history record of anything so disgraceful to the human intellect as the modern idea that the commercial texts buy in the cheapest market and sell in the dearest represents, or under any circumstances would represent an available principle of national economy. Buy in the cheapest market? Yes but what made your market cheap? Charcoal may be cheap among your roof timbers after a fire, 
and bricks may be cheap in your streets after an earthquake, but fire and earthquake may not therefore be national benefits. Sell in the dearest, yes, truly, but what made your market dear? You sold your bread well today, was it to a dying man who gave his last coin for it and will never need bread more? Or to a rich man who tomorrow will buy your farm over your head? Or to a soldier on his way to pillage the bank in which you have put your fortune? None of these things you can know. One thing only you can know, namely, whether this dealing of yours is a just and faithful one which is all you need concern yourself about respecting it. Sure thus to have done your own part in bringing about ultimately in the world a state of things which will not issue in pillage or in death. And thus every question concerning these things merges itself ultimately in the great question of justice which, the ground being thus cleared for it, I will enter upon in the next paper, leaving only in this three final points for the reader's consideration. It has been shown that the chief value and virtue of money consists in its having power over human beings, that without this power, large material possessions are useless, and to any person possessing such power, comparatively unnecessary. But power over human beings is attainable by other means than by money. As I said a few pages back, the money power is always imperfect and doubtful. There are many things which cannot be reached with it, others which cannot be retained by it. Many joys may be given to men which cannot be bought for gold, and many fidelities found in them which cannot be rewarded with it. Trite enough, the reader thinks. Yes, but it is not so trite. I wish it were. That in this moral power, quite inscrutable and immeasurable though it be, there is a monetary value, value just as real as that represented by more ponderous currency. A man's hand may be full of invisible gold, and the wave of it, or the grass, shall do more than another's share with a shower of bargain. This invisible gold also does not necessarily diminish in spending. Political economists will do well some day to take heed of it, though they cannot take measure. But father, since the essence of wealth consists in its authority over men, if the apparent nominal wealth fail in this power, it fails in essence in fact, ceases to be wealth at all. It does not appear lately in England that our authority over men is absolute. The servants show some disposition to rush riotously upstairs under an impression that their wages are not regularly paid. We should augur ill for any gentleman's property to whom this happened every other day in his drawing room. So also, the power of our wealth seems limited as respects the comfort of the servants, no less than their quietude. The persons in the kitchen appear to be ill-dressed, squalid, half-starved. One cannot help imagining that the riches of the establishment must be of a very theoretical and documentary character. Finally, since the essence of wealth consists in power over men, Will it not follow that the nobler and the more in number the persons are over whom it has power, the greater the wealth? Perhaps it may even appear after some consideration that the persons themselves are the wealth, that these pieces of gold with which we are in the habit of guiding them are in fact nothing more than a kind of Byzantine harvest or trappings, very glittering and beautiful in barbaric sight wherewith we bridle the creatures, but that if these same living creatures could be guided without the fretting and jingling of the Byzants in their mouths and ears, they might themselves be more valuable than their bridles. In fact, it may be discovered that the true veins of wealth 
are purple and not in rock, but in flesh. Perhaps even that the final outcome and consummation of all wealth is in the producing of as many as possible full-breathed, bright-eyed and happy-hearted human creatures. Our modern world, I think, has rather a tendency the other way. Most political economists appearing to consider multitudes of human creatures not conducive to wealth, or at best conducive to it only by remaining in a dim-eyed and narrow-chested state of being. Nevertheless, it is open, I repeat, to serious questions, which I leave to the reader's pondering whether among national manufactures, that of souls of a good quality may not at last turn out a quite leadingly lucrative one. Nay, in some far away and yet undreamt of hour, I can even imagine that England may cast all thoughts of possessive wealth back to the barbaric nations among whom they first arose, and that while the sands of the Indus and adamant of Golconda may yet stiffen the housings of the Jaja and flash from the turban of the slave, she as a Christian mother may at last attain to the virtues and the treasures of a heathen one and may be able to lead forth her son saying, these are my jewels. Um, I think I would like to take issue with Ruskin at this point. I object to his use of the word barbaric nation. India had a greater civilization than our own. And uh, this patronizing aspect of being the Christian mother over heathen ones, I would like to take issue with that. Um, he's publishing this in 1860 in the Cornhill magazine. At the same time, that uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning published her second to last poem, Musical Instrument, that Lord Leighton illustrated. And following that, Romola was published by George Eliot in the Cornhill magazine. I see all of this in terms of economy, Thomas More's Utopia, Swift's Modest Proposal. David Ricardo was writing during the time of the Irish famine, which is just ended 12 years, before, well, eight years before this was written, uh, about laissez-faire economy, let them starve. Milton Friedman in his uh, economy, econ economics continues that vein, and it is highly immoral. Um, I see money as a simple system that's pretty empty. The real things are land, work, material. And uh, so we have theory, we have practice. But in practice, um, my great-grandfather, Sir James Roberts, was born in poverty in Harworth, walked barefoot across the moors at a levee, which was illegal to work in the mills, became manager at 18, bought Saltaire, which was a model community, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, doubled it in size with the Italian architect he saw in St. Petersburg, where he traded wool and cloth, paid his workers even when they were fighting in the trenches in World War I so they could sustain their families, and really believed in the ethics of work and so forth. And to go back to these riches of the barbaric nations, Look at the objects on Belinda's dressing table in Pope's Rape of the Lock and think of Conrad's Heart of Darkness where he parallels Belgium and the Belgian Congo and its unethical behaviour with Marlowe talking about this also in England uh, as they talk on the shores of the Thames and think in terms also of the Opium Wars the ways in which so much of our commerce and trade is based on addiction, uh, which is immoral, whether it be caffeine, tea, drugs, and so forth. I'm very grateful to have had the chance to read this, and I'm sorry that my voice was in such bad shape. <laughs> wonderful, 
wonderful, Julia. Thank you so much. I'm just going to intervene um, on housekeeping. So we really only have 15 minutes until our hour and a half will be up. And I'm mindful of everyone's day and uh, attention span and capacity. And so um, much as I would love to open the discussion up now, I really think, Arjun, I'd like to invite you to follow up with your readings from Gandhi, as this is a very important element of today. And then if we have any time at the end for some brief last thoughts from anyone, that would be welcome. Arjun, over to you. But let me just uh, say, Julie, that was very, very brief. In, in light of the previous essay, I feel that um, Gandhi could really be said to be the wealthiest man uh, at the time of India's independence. Uh, by whatever standards Ruskin has talked about, the healthiest uh, type of inequality in one's favor, the healthiest power over other human beings, the healthiest power over uh, numerous noble human beings. I think Gandhi had it. Let me read for you uh, the introduction and conclusion of his paraphrase of Unto This Lost. Uh, remember, he wrote this in 1908. So before the two world wars and while he was still in South Africa. People in the West generally hold that the whole duty of man is to promote the happiness of the majority of mankind. And happiness is supposed to mean only physical happiness and economic prosperity. If the laws of morality are broken in the quest of this happiness, it does not matter very much. Again, as the object sought to be attained in the hands of the majority, Westerners do not think there is any harm if this is secured by sacrificing a minority. The consequences of this line of thinking are writ large on the face of Europe. This exclusive search for physical and economic well-being prosecuted in disregard of morality is contrary to divine law, as some wise men in the West have shown. One of these was John Ruskin, who contends in unto this law that men can be happy only if they obey the moral law. We in India are very much given nowadays to an imitation of the West. It is necessary to imitate the virtues of the West, but there is no doubt that Western standards are often bad, and everyone will agree that we should shun all evil things. The Indians in South Africa are reduced to a sorry plight. We go abroad in order to make money, and in trying to get rich quick, we lose all sight of morality and forget that God will judge all our acts. Self-interest absorbs our energies and paralyzes our power of discrimination between good and evil. The result is that instead of gaining anything, we lose a great deal by staying in foreign countries, or at least we fail to derive full benefit from it. Morality is an essential ingredient in all the fates of the world. But apart from religion, a common sense indicates the necessity of observing the moral law. Only by observing it can we hope to be happy, as Rustin shows in the following pages. Socrates, in Plato's Apology, gives us some idea of a duty as men, and he, and he was as good as his word. I feel that Ruskin's Unto This Last is an expansion of Socrates' ideas. He tells us how men in various walks of life should behave if they intend to translate these ideas into what follows is not a translation into this class, but a paraphrase, and the translation would not be particularly useful to the leaders of Indian opinion. Indian opinion was a newspaper South, uh, Gandhi ran in South Africa at the time. Even the title has not been translated, but paraphrased as Sarvodya, the welfare of all, as that was what Ruskin aimed at in writing this book. The conclusion, and uh, before reading the conclusion, I would also like to just uh, bring to your attention that what Ruskin writes about it is not abstract, it is not wishy-washy, theoretical, it is not that. Gandhi is case in point that if practiced sincerely to the letter, it is a very powerful thing that Ruskin is talking about. It is powerful enough to bring an the the an entire empire, the greatest empire at the time to its knees. It is very much possible. The conclusion. 
Ruskin's book thus paraphrased as a lesson for Indians, no less than for the Englishmen to whom it was primarily addressed. New ideas are in the air in India. Our young men who have received Western education are full of spirit. The spirit should be directed into the right channels, as otherwise it can only do us harm. Let us have Swaraj is one slogan. Let us industrialize the other the country is another. Swaraj in Sanskrit means uh, self-rule. We hardly understand what Swaraj is. Natal, the province of the time of South Africa in our hospitals, for she crushes the Negroes and oppresses the Indians. If by some chance the Negroes and the Indians left Natal, its white men would fight amongst themselves and bring about their own destruction. If not like Natal, will we have Suraj as in the Transvaal, another South African province, one of whose leaders, General Smuts, breaks his promises, says one thing and does another. He has dispensed with the services of English policemen and employed Afrikanders instead. I do not think that this is going to help any of the nationalities in the long run. Selfish men will loot their own people when there are no more outsiders left to be looted. Thus, Swaraj is not enough to make a nation happy. What would be the result of Swaraj being conferred on a band of robbers? They would be happy only if they were placed under the control of a good man who was not a robber himself. The United States, England and France, for instance, are powerful states. But there is no reason to think that they are really happy. Suraj really means self-control. Only he is capable of self-control who observes the rules of morality, does not cheat or give up truth, and does his duty to his parents, wife and children, servants and neighbors. Such a man is an enjoyment of Suraj no matter where he lives. A state enjoys Suraj if it can boast of a large number of such good citizens. It is not right that one people should rule another. British rule in India is an evil, but let us not run away with the idea that all will be well when the British quit India. The existence of British rule in the country is due to our disunity, immorality, and ignorance. If these national defects were overcome, not only would the British leave India without a shot being fired, but we would be enjoying real Suraj. Some foolish Indians rejoice in bomb throwing. But if all the Britishers in the country were thus killed, the killers would become the rulers of India. They would only have a change of masters. The bomb now thrown at Englishmen will be aimed at Indians after the English are there no longer. It was a Frenchman who murdered the president of the French Republic. It was an American who murdered President Cleveland. Let us not blindly imitate Western people. If Suraj cannot be attained by the sin of killing Englishmen, it cannot be attained either by the erection of huge factories. Gold and silver may be accumulated, but they will not lead to the establishment of Suraj. Ruskin has proved this to the hill. Western civilization is a mere baby, a hundred or only fifty years old, and yet it has reduced Europe to sorry plight. Let us pray that India is saved from the fate that has overtaken Europe, that the nations are poised for an attack on one another, and are silent only because of the stockpiling of armaments. Remember once again, this was 1908 when he wrote this. Someday there will be an explosion, and then Europe will be a veritable hell on earth. Non-white races are looked upon as legitimate prey by every European state. What else can we expect where covetousness is the ruling passion in the breasts of men? Europeans pounce upon new territories like crows upon a piece of meat. I am inclined to think that this is due to their mass production factories. India must indeed have Suraj, but she must have it by righteous methods. Our Suraj must be real Suraj, which cannot be attained by either violence or industrialization. India was once a golden land because Indians then had hearts of gold. The land is still the same, but it is a desert because we are corrupt. It can become a land of gold again only if the base metal of a present national character is transmuted into gold. The philosopher's stone which can effect this transformation is a little word of two syllables, satya, truth. 
if every Indian speaks to truth, so God's will come to us of its own accord. Let it be noted that uh, Gandhi himself was also killed by an Indian. And uh, let it also be noted that uh, the government in India today is possibly um, as corrupt as it can be. And let it further also be noted that I feel that the people of India are also as corrupt as it is possible for them to be. I do not think a nation can have a corrupt government without a government, without a corrupt people. It is not possible according to me. Uh, it is also, it might be interesting to uh, relate my own experience of uh, primarily psychologically moving, returning from the United Kingdom to India. Uh, I could not, I could not live in the UK. Uh, to me as well, uh, in my nostrils, it did stink. Uh, the cleaner roads, the fresher air, the, the frankly, in general, better architecture. That was all good, that was all good. But I could not appreciate it, having in my mind that it really was all loot. And it was loot from my own nation. I could not get over the fact. I did return to my country, I did return to India, uh, imagining that I would be returning to this land of gold that Gandhi talks about. I imagined that I would be returning to the land of Gandhi and the gold. And it took me about five years from that point to uh, to realize that that was an illusion. There is no more land of gold. I have lost. The, I have lost that hope. There is no more land of gold. There is no more India to return to. We have lost the plot. Um, we are a very, very, very bad imitation of the West now. Of course was moving very rapidly ahead, but uh, we are not the India that I was hoping I would return to. What I have further realized though, is that uh, even though there is no more India to return to, India has returned to me. I have it within myself and I am very happy about it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Arjun, enormously for a very beautiful way of bringing today's session towards its conclusion. What I'm going to suggest is that to honour our commitment to run for no more than an hour and a half is I will just wind up with some thank yous and cease the recording. And if anyone has the time and would like to stay and talk informally, you're welcome to do so. But nobody must feel under an obligation to do so because we all have lives, meals, children, dependents, whatever it might be, or sleep um, to, to enjoy. Can I also say, do have a look in the chat because some people who've already left um, the call have left some very appreciative remarks. Mark Usher has left an interesting response, Julia, to your point about Christian mother, uh, which is interesting. Kay, you make a very lovely point about um, the makers of aeroplanes who fail to put tight bolts in their door plugs and so the doors fall off um, in contrast to uh, Ruskin's tale. But uh, while you're doing that, can I, on behalf of all of us, thank enormously Arjun, Peter, Helen, Francis and Julia for your immensely thoughtful and I know very carefully prepared and then beautifully mellifluous contributions today. It has been a real joy to listen Aww. to you reading this wonderful text. And can I say also that I hope very much many, if not all of you, will be able to join us for the next reading, the third of the five readings, which will be at the same time on Saturday the 9th of March. It will be wonderful to have you join us Indeed, one or two of the people who are here are going to be readers uh, for that session convened by Peter Berman. We will have readers um, from Russia, from Cumbria and Japan. So once again, a truly global event. So thank you all enormously for attending today. I'm now going to uh, bring the recording to an end.